multiculturalism in this area. So what I want to do now is I just want to look at some of the themes that the Smithsonian Exhibition speaks to. But not only that, but the folks here at Pine Coast Garden have put up some really great stuff in there, like some of these terms attractions, which obviously means work. Uh, and I wanted to just talk about that. I've written down a couple notes in the middle of watching several football games today, and I wanted to talk about commercial aviation, which is one of the themes. And obviously, we had maritime aviation. We had islands, and we had areas that abutted this game bay, like this game island, that hosted airfields and what have you in the 1920s. But the first real breakthrough of what's going to be a major airline is Pan American Airways in 1928, coming up from Key West to Miami, specifically to 36th Street and Northwest 52nd Avenue, called Pan American Field. And then a year later, Juan Tripp, this Yale-educated leader of Pan American Airways, he bought out a guy named Ralph O'Neill, who had something called the New York, uh, Buenos Aires, Rio airline that was operating a seaplane operation off of Dinner Key. Now, how could he do that? Well, Dinner Key at that time was connected to the mainland. It had, it had been a naval air station in World War I. And so they had dredged it and they had filled in what was a swampy area, depending on what the tide was. And so Pan Am operated a seaplane base there. By the mid 30s, Eastern Airlines is based here, grew out of a small airline. National is based here, founded here. Delta had a large presence here. So all of these things are going on in terms of aviation, and it's very, very important in terms of this theme of work because there have been studies about 50 plus years ago, in 1964, that indicated that 25% of the workforce of Miami-Dade County either worked directly with the airlines or an ancillary business. So clearly, aviation uh, was a big thing. And of course, sadly, we've lost both Pan Am and Eastern in recent decades. Um, I wanted to talk further about employment, and I thought World War II was an appropriate topic for that. In World War II, we had a naval air station down in uh, Richmond Air Base. Those were reconnaissance blimps. We had a naval air station that shared space with Pan American at Dinner and Key, where City Hall is today. Um, we had a huge naval presence in downtown Miami. They took over the hotels down there. And the naval presence was very fascinating because it wasn't just American naval personnel, it was also Chinese and Soviet because we were allied with them. We had so-called Donald Duck Navy that was over right around where the old Port of Miami used to be, right at the edge of today's museum park. The Donald Duck Navy was an anti-submarine training school because there were German subs in these waters until the late spring of 1943. They didn't hit us too much. They hit one ship, a Mexican tanker, down in South Bay, uh, and it kind of limped along the edge of the bay and what have you. But they really hit off the coast of Broward County and Palm Beach County. Um, and we had many other people. The airport was taken over by the Army. I became the uh, Miami Army Air Depot. Um, there were parades every Saturday beginning about January of 1942 until the end of the war that began at the county courthouse which is 73 West Black, and those parades marched east in the Bayfront Park to raise patriotic fervor to sell war bonds. So uh, this was a, an armed forces camp and training camp, and I don't want to forget to mention that the Army Air Corps took over South Beach. And hundreds of thousands of men and women actually went through South Beach training, either technical training, even basic training that went on there. So I think employment then uh, was helped along tremendously by the military. You might ask, well, why here? The land is flat, with the exception of Conk Hill, of course. The land is flat, there's plenty of water, the weather's usually good, with the exception of the last week or so. So uh, it was really a draw for the military to come down here. And then the military, after the war didn't leave, there were still, there was a Naval Reserve Station, and, um, the Homestead Air Force Base became a strategic air command base in 1954, and that was huge. It was one of the few what they call SAC bases in America. And they flew planes, B-52s, that carried nuclear weapons, so it was really a major base. And it's gone on since that time. Um, and then I wanted to look at agriculture, since that's a major theme, and so much of Pinecrest were large groves of primarily mangoes and avocados. But pre-agricultural Miami, even though the population was scattered, that's all anybody did. 
But what's interesting is, is that the primary cash crop were mangoes or avocados or papayas or whatever, but it was what the Indians called kunti or kamti. It was a starch that was ground out of the root, a large tuber of a cycad plant. That we believe that the Quest Indians taught those that came after them, the Seminoles, and the Seminoles picked up on it, and they taught some of the white settlers here how to crush this root that's toxic and just eliminate the, uh, the arsenic from it, and you can use it to kind of beef up stews and soups, or you can make biscuits out of it, or what have you. That was the number one cash crop in the area as late as the 1890s. Everybody had like a little kunti mill on their farm. It could be donkey power, horse power, water power, wind power. Uh, there was one on the north bank of the Miami River. That was the biggest mill as far back as the 1840s. The water would fall from the eastern edge of the Everglades. I'm going to shock you now. The Everglades in that area where the Miami Canal is, that is West 27th Avenue. The Everglades came in as far as about 33rd Avenue in that area. It fell into what we call the falls, and then there were these big boulders, and so the water kind of caught a swirl, and that swirl powered the machinery to crush this root that these two brothers ran, the Ferguson brothers. That was the biggest business in Bay County in 1848-49. An estimated $25,000 in sales each of those years. So agriculture was big, and of course, the home of agriculture in the last almost century has been South Bay. But what if I told you that alapata, said to be an Indian term for alligator, what if I told you that alapata, as late as the 1950s, had farming? The soil in alapata is, is a judge to be about as much of the soil anywhere in today's Miami-Dade County. But that was a tremendous farming community. What happened was the great real estate boom in the mid-20s took a lot of that farmland and just converted it into a residential population. But they were still farming there as late as the 1950s. And then I wanted to look at commerce. I kind of define commerce as trade, and I think you need to come back to the original port of Miami. Well, actually, the original, original port of Miami was uh, right around today's Miami Avenue on the north bank of the river called the Terminal Docks. But the first full-blown port opened up in the first decade of the 20th century where Museum Park is today. There was a lot of trade that came out of there to the West Indies, to other parts of Central and South America. Uh, the Miami River today, and even yesterday, is the fifth busiest port in the state of Florida. And the river is only four and a half miles in its original dimensions. It's got a 90 mile canal. It takes you up Lake Okeechobee. So we've had a lot of trade. The river's doing $4 billion a year in trade. The Port of Miami, of course, is one of the biggest trading ports in all of Florida. So we've got trade. The airport. The airport was known as the 36th Street Airport because in the years after Pan American established its presence in 1928 out there, it kind of inched in a easterly direction along Northwest 36th Street all the way down to Lejeune Road. In fact, if you lived in the Miami of 55, 60 years ago, the, the busiest corner, also known as Crash Corner, was Lejeune Road and Northwest 36th Street. All the workers making that left-hand turn to go to work. You know, just there's so many plants there. Either directly with the airlines or again these ancillary businesses that tie with the airlines. And the airport, the 36th Street Airport, also known as Pan American Field, began to call itself Miami International Airport in 1948. And at that time, it was among the top 10 airports in America in terms of moving cargo to Latin America and the Caribbean. So we've been digging trade for a long time. And again, I think it all, it all goes back to, as the real estate people would say, location, location, location. And then we've got other elements, I think, that are worth mentioning of commerce, commercial activities. And I think we cannot forget the fact that Miami had two tremendous benefactors to really kickstart those first decades of Miami's corporate existence. One, of course, was Henry Flight. That his programs put a lot of people to work, whether it was a railroad or the farms that he set up. He had an experimental farm over here, the edge of Pine Crest, known as Flagler Groves. Um, he built two rows, two, two blocks of homes in downtown Miami. He had a very large staff at the Royal Palm Hotel. In fact, somebody figured out that for every guest at the Royal Palm, there were two employees as attendants during the harvest season. 
So I, I think of Flagler was a great benefactor. He died in 1913, and lo and behold, about that time, we got a second great benefactor, and that was James Deming. It's estimated that 10% of Miami's population between 1914 and 1916, when the sky was constructed, the gardens weren't finished until 1925, but during that time, 1914 and 1916, 10% of the population, not the workforce, but the population were employed in some element of the work surrounding the sky. So we had Darren, and then we had, as the 20s went on, we had these larger-than-life developers that you all are familiar with, George Merrick developed Carl Gables beginning officially in 1921. He was already building before that. And Carl Fisher with Miami Beach, officially in the 1920s, he was actually building before that. My God, he played out Lincoln Road in 1914. He had to cut it through a mangrove swamp. And you might think, well, you know, mangroves grow only in the shoreline, not in the case of Miami Beach. It was concave in the interior. You had mangroves going all the way inland. So you had Carl Fisher, you had Hugh Anderson and Roy Wright developing uh, today's Miami Shores. Or you had these very, very interesting brothers, the Tatum brothers, or four of them, developing Florida City, developing parts of today's Little Havana. Uh, it just goes on of, of developing Alta Del Mar on North Beach, and Miami Beach. It just goes on and on and on. So we have long had these large employers. And then the Mackles come along. Not just so much of Key Biscayne, but Westwood Lakes and many other subdivisions. And it just has really taken us up to the recent past in terms of message. I guess you could say the Jorge Perez today, being a massive developer like he is, is a major employer. And we have both benefited and been cursed by these booms. The boom that collapsed around 2006 or 7, prior to that time, hard hats all over the place. And the boom that's underway right now, the people are working everywhere, different shifts. Um, Interestingly enough, we are an international city who developed Brickle Key and Clawton Island, Swire Limited. They began developing in 1979. There was hardly anything there until that time. Where were they based? Hong Kong. What are they developing now? Brickle City Center. It's just so massive, it's just, just improbable how big it is. And you can see the workers in different ships coming off, just rows and rows. Or when Brickell Avenue was developed for the first time in terms of high-rise vertical living, that was the late 70s, early 80s. It was an unbelievable transformation. So we live in a very exciting place uh, that's had many of the themes that we've seen over there. We've had a lot of agriculture, still do in South Dade. How many other counties do you think in this country with about 2.8 million people still have as large an agricultural sector as we do? Very few. Let's look what happened to Broward. Uh, Broward had an estimated, at the end of World War II, 40,000 acres of land and agricultural production. I don't know what Broward has today, but it's hardly anything. Why? Because it's almost like a rectangular county, and they just pushed as far west as they could, out to I-75, 27, right on the edge of the Everglades. And of course, if they had their brothers, they'd be in the middle of the Everglades right now. Thank God for Everglades National Park. So we've got such an unusual place here, and uh, the exhibition speaks to it. One of the final things I wanted to talk about in terms of work, but also just commerce and all, have been the tourist attractions. And what's so interesting about the tourist attractions is the fact that the major tourist attractions when life was much simpler for all of us, which would have been in the early middle decades of the 20th century, were essentially based down here. Because there was so much open land, there was so much farmland. Rare Bird Farm, which began operating in the early 1930s and was over by the end of the 1960s. The Serpentarium, which opened in 1948, was over by the mid-1980s. The Orchid Jungle, which began in the 1920s. The Monkey Jungle, which began in the early 1930s. The Parrot Jungle, which began in 1936. They were all based down here. And people trekked from all over to see these things. They were great attractions. So we live in this very, very unique area. And the exhibition, both what the Pinecrest Gardens folks have put up, as well as the Smithsonian's brought down here, I think really speaks appropriately to a lot of the history of the area.